Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, Learn Your Power, How the Affordable Care Act Helps LGBT Americans. The purpose of this webinar is to help inform lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people and allies about the various ways the uh, landmark health reform law, the Affordable Care Act, impacts uh, LGBT people and their families. I'm Darlene Nipper, Deputy Executive Director at the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. And we at the task force are proud to co-sponsor this webinar with the Center for American Progress. Now, and I just want to take a moment to note that I, I believe the screen says I'm Samantha, but I assure you, I'm Darlene. So uh, no worries about the screen saying that Samantha is talking. It's actually Darlene Newport. We also want to give a special recognition to Doctors for America for their support and technical assistance on securing the webinar technology that we're using today. Thank you very much to Doctors for America. So before jumping into the substance of the webinar, I'd like to provide a brief rundown of the uh, agenda for today's webinar. We'll start with a, with a few comments from me um, sort of setting the stage for the discussion. Then we will have the privilege of being joined by Myra Alvarez, Director of Public Health Policy in the Office of Health Reform at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Myra will explain to us exactly what the Affordable Care Act means, what it does, and how it impacts lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people and their families. Then we'll have the pleasure of hearing from Kellen Baker, who is a policy, health policy analyst at the Center for American Progress about how the LGBT advocacy community is working to ensure that the various provisions within the law are implemented in a way that actually ensures greater access and protection for LGBT people in uh, health insurance programs. And then finally, we will hear from Brad Clark, who is Executive Director of One Colorado, the statewide LGBT advocacy organization in Colorado. Brad will give us an update on how the state-based uh, LGBT advocacy community is working to ensure that uh, state departments of health actually implement this in a way that uh, includes LGBT protection and access. After we hear from our final speaker, we will take questions from you, our participants, and then we'll do a wrap-up. So I hope all of that makes sense, and why don't we go ahead and get started. Two years ago, passage of federal health care reform marked a critical step toward ensuring access to health care for millions of people who are uninsured and, and toward ending some of the uh, health insurance industry's most egregious uh, abuses. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people and their families are among those affected by this broken and imbalanced health care system. Indeed, studies show that LGBT people often face higher incidence of health disparities and discrimination in healthcare settings. And in fact, for example, the National uh, Transgender Discrimination Survey conducted by the uh, National Gay and Lesbian Task Force and the National Center for Transgender Equality found 50%, again, 50% of transgender respondents indicated that they have to teach their doctors, they teach their doctors, their medical providers about transgender care. And some 19% of uh, respondents reported being refused medical care outright due to their transgender or gender non-conforming status. Unfortunately, we found even higher numbers among people of color in the survey. We also know from uh, a report undertaken by the Institute of Medicine about disparities in care for LGBT people that LGBT people face greater health disparities than the general population and that factors such as race, ethnicity, social economic status, geographic location, and age further exacerbate the barriers to care. These observations remind us that LGBT people aren't just defined by uh, sexual orientation or gender identity, but by the multiple identities that shape who we are. The Affordable Care Act is helping to better ensure that LGBT people, and of course all Americans, are able to access the health care they need. So today, as we reflect on the second anniversary of the Affordable Care Act, we have the opportunity to hear from expert speakers who will explain in more detail how the Affordable Care Act addresses the health care needs of LGBT Americans in a variety of ways. And we know that meeting the needs of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people who are disproportionately unemployed or underemployed, uninsured or underinsured, and have more pre-existing conditions than many other Americans 
is a critical public health issue in this country that must be addressed. Because this law brings access to care to underserved populations, it literally has the potential to save the lives of LGBT people across the country. But not enough people know about the benefits available to them under the law, and that is why we are here today. We are bringing together the federal government and experts from the federal government and federal and state LGBT community advocates to give you a chance to learn more about this law and to get your questions answered. With that, I think this is a good time to move forward with our program. But before I uh, introduce our first speaker, Myra Alvarez from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, I just want to take a moment to uh, do a quick programming reminder. So um, you should have a dialogue box on your upper right hand on the upper right hand corner of your screen. If you have questions during the webinar, please feel free to type these questions into that dialogue box. And after the speakers are done, I will read your questions to them so that you know, they will have a chance to answer them for you. Also, just a note, we're recording this webinar and we'll post it online in the coming days so that you may view it again and, of course, share it with those that you know were unavailable to attend today. So you should look for a message regarding that in your email box. So as I mentioned before, Myra is the Director of Public Health Policy in the Office of uh, Health Reform at the Department of Health and Human Services, which means that she really is the person that knows the most about how the Affordable Care Act has an impact on the public, and we're very, very lucky, lucky to have her join us for this webinar today. So why don't we go ahead and get started with Myra. Please, Myra, take it away. Thank you, Darlene. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. As Darlene said, my name is Myra Alvarez, and I'm from the Department of Health and Human Services. And I'm excited to be here with you today to talk about the health care law, the Affordable Care Act, and specifically what it means for you, your family, and members of the LGBT community across our country. Um, next slide, please. So the first question most people have is, why did we need the health care law? Well, the answer is that we had a health insurance market that worked very well for big insurance companies, but not so well for average Americans and American families. Insurers could pick and choose who they gave coverage to, and premiums were skyrocketing, even as insurers made record profits. This obviously made it hard for families and individuals across our country to get the security that health insurance provides. In total, 50 million people across the country were uninsured, and tens of millions more had coverage that didn't cover critical treatments or preventive care. And many of us who had insurance, we didn't understand the basics of our plan and were afraid we could lose it if our employer dropped coverage or we switched jobs or we retired. For the LGBT community, an often worse picture was painted. LGBT Americans face specific challenges in both the workplace and at the hospital. Many times providers were not equipped with the cultural competency they should have to adequately serve the needs of the LGBT community. And studies have shown that health disparities related to both sexual orientation and gender identity are due in part to the lower rates of health coverage as well as this lack of cultural competency that exists in the healthcare system. This left many Americans feeling like their health care choices were out of their hands. So that's why Congress passed and the President signed the Affordable Care Act. The Department of Health and Human Services has worked hard over the last few years to improve the lives of lesbians, gays, bisexuals, and transgender people. But nowhere is this more clear than in the implementation of this important law. As we work to implement the law, we continue to pay close attention to the unique health care needs of the LGBT population. And we welcome input and feedback from LGBT health experts and individuals across the country like those of you on the line today. We have a lot of work to do and we need you to help us. But the progress we're making is real and I'm excited to be here to tell you more about it. The health care law specifically builds on what works in our health care system and it fixes what's broken by making improvements in four key areas. First, it protects you from the worst insurance company abuses. 
Second, it makes health care more affordable. Third, it gives you better access to care. And finally, it strengthens our Medicare program. Today I'm going to talk a little bit more about each of these areas and how they impact the LGBT community. So in the past, insurance companies could take advantage of you. They could deny coverage to children who had asthma or were born with a heart defect. The very young people who need health insurance the most and insurers were free to turn them away. They could also put a lifetime cap on the amount of care they would pay for. So if you developed a serious condition like cancer or a rare blood disease, or you were injured in a car crash, your insurance could disappear right when you needed it the most. And worst of all, they could cancel your coverage when you got sick just by finding an accidental mistake in your paperwork. Some insurance companies even use computer programs designed to search the records of people with breast cancer or people with HIV looking for these errors. It's hard to believe it was even happening. So the first main way the law helps you is by creating a new patient's bill of rights that protects you from these and other abusive practices, also important for the LGBT community. LGBT individuals have encountered discrimination in the healthcare system for decades, and many studies have shown that they are affected by chronic disease at a higher rate than other Americans. The new law has already made significant progress toward ending some of the worst insurance company abuses and helping ensure that LGBT Americans have access to coverage when they need it most. Now, you'll never have to worry about these abuses happening to you or your family ever again. On the slide in front of you is just a couple of the major headlines we've been able to see across the country that highlight what was going on before the Affordable Care Act became law. The second way the law helps you is by bringing down health care costs and making sure your health care dollars are spent wisely. Today, some private insurance companies spend almost half your premium on overhead, like marketing and CEO salaries, leaving only 60 cents of every premium dollar to spend on actual health care services. The health care law ensures you get a fair value for your premium by creating what we call the new 80-20 rule. Insurers must now spend at least 80% of your premium on health care services or on improving those health care services. If they don't, they must repay the money. Based on the decisions that the department has made regarding this 80-20 rule, we've been able to approve some uh, states that are asking for certain waivers. We've been able to deny many states' requests um, for certain waivers to this rule. And based on the decisions that we've made, we're predicting that up to $323 million will go back to beneficiaries across the country. That's real dollars back in the pockets of people that need it most. But we also know that over the last decade, premiums have grown three times faster than wages. That's why the health care law has new rules that require insurance companies for the first time ever to publicly justify any rate increase of 10% or more. And it gives states new resources to review and block these premium hikes. The days of insurance companies hiking your rates under the cover of darkness are truly over. And we are already seeing these rules pay off across the country. Next slide, please. Uh, you'll see in front of you some of the major headlines that we've been able to see. States from Connecticut to Massachusetts, Oregon, North Dakota, California, they really try to take this full advantage in order to make sure that their constituents, the people in their communities, are getting a fair value for their dollar. Next slide, please. The law also provides special relief for small businesses. Small businesses are the engine of the American economy. They create two out of every three jobs in this country. But in the old system before this law, the mom and pop shop on the corner paid an average of 18% more for the same health coverage as the big chain down the street. This makes it hard for small businesses to attract and keep the best employees. What the health care law does is give small businesses tax credits to help them afford coverage, to help them give them the same quality health insurance coverage that the big chains are able to do for their hardworking employees. Now, fewer small businesses have to choose between hiring and health care. 
The third key part of the law is a set of improvements that increase your access to affordable care. For years, young adults have had some of the highest rates of being uninsured. Most young people lost their family coverage when they graduated high school or college, and it was often a few years before they got a job that offered good health coverage. What this meant was that if they got in a car accident or got an unexpected diagnosis while they were uninsured, they could go broke or their families could go broke simply by trying to pay for the care they need. Now, under the law, young adults who don't get coverage through their jobs can stay on their parents' plan until their age of 26, a change that has already allowed 2.5 million young people across the country to get health coverage and has given their families the peace of mind they need to know that their, their young adult is going to be looked after. The law is also expanding access to preventive care services. We know that getting the right preventive care is actually one of the best ways we can stay healthy. But too many Americans went without this care because it often required expensive co-pays. Think about everyone's pressing needs in our day-to-day -day lives. When we have to make a choice between paying a $40 copay to go in for a mammogram or paying $40 for groceries or to put gas in our car, too many people had to take their chances. Now, they don't have to face that tough decision. Thanks to the health care law, the healthy choice is the easy and the affordable choice. In new plans, a wide range of recommended preventive services are available for free. And that won't just help people stay healthy, it will also help avoid costly hospitalizations that raise insurance costs for all of us. But under the old system, no one got a worse deal than the almost 130 million people with pre-existing conditions. When buying coverage on their own, insurance companies were free to hike their rates or carve out needed benefits, and in many cases, lock them out of the insurance market altogether. For people with serious medical conditions like cancer or HIV, this often meant they couldn't afford the treatments that could save their lives. The health care law has given Americans who have been locked out of the market for their pre-existing conditions a new coverage option. As a result of the pre-existing condition insurance plan that we have made available in all 50 states, more than 50,000 people with serious health conditions across the country are now getting the health insurance they need. But I think we all know that having a health insurance card wasn't the only obstacle to care. Too often you'd call up your doctor and hear that your next appointment was in four months. Or you'd only see your doctor for 10 minutes because they had to rush on to their next patient. That's why the healthcare law also invests in training and placing thousands of new doctors and nurses in communities that need them most. And by providing bonus payments to primary care doctors, we've made a huge investment in our National Health Service Corps. Since President Obama came into office, we've actually tripled the size of the National Health Service Corps. For those of you unfamiliar with the program, the program actually offers scholarships and loan repayment for individuals that have gone through health profession schools but that decide to dedicate at least two years to an underserved community. And the best part of the people that go through this program is that over 80% of them stay in the communities in which they serve. So they're not popping into these underserved areas for two years and then leaving back to bigger cities. They're staying in underserved areas and they're contributing to the growth and, and the positive health of that community. That's not only good for the experience of that individual medical resident or, or advanced practice nurse, it's also good for the continuity of care of the people that we're serving, that they have a medical home, that they have a provider that they can call their own. And we're excited to keep growing that program through the Affordable Care Act investment. But we're also creating and expanding our community health centers across the country. Also a big effort to help individuals see and spend more time with their health care provider. Each of these improvements helps fill gaps in our health care system. And the changes that we've explained are just the beginning. In 2014, a new marketplace called an Affordable Insurance Exchange will be created in every state for families and small business owners who buy their own health insurance. These marketplaces will function like Expedia or Orbit for health care coverage. I'm sure many of you on the line, you are tech savvy enough to actually be part of this webinar. 
Well, I bet the majority of you go to a website to purchase your airplane tickets. Whether it's Expedia or Orbitz or Cheap Tickets or Priceline, you go as an informed consumer when you're purchasing your airplane ticket. You know your budget, you know what time you want to arrive, what time you want to leave, you want a snack pack, and you go to this website, you input some basic information, and up comes your menu of options. You make an educated decision about your airplane ticket. And when you purchase that airplane ticket, I can bet that you don't wonder about the security of that airplane. Or you don't wonder if your pilot has gotten his license and is legally able to fly that plane. Well, when we talk about health insurance, it's a very different picture for people. I think many of us that receive our health insurance packet each year during our open enrollment period, it's a thick packet, it's a small font, we're lucky to thumb through it, but most of the time, it's like me. You sign where you need to sign and you go on your merry way. We make very risky decisions on something as important as our health status. And we should be just as informed of our health policy, just as secure that that health policy is looking out for our best interests as we are when we're purchasing our airplane ticket. That's what we're expecting to do with these new affordable insurance exchanges. The, the law includes a few important rules set up specifically to protect you and look out for your best interests as a consumer. For example, no turning people away because of pre-existing conditions. This is especially important to members of the LGBT community. Transgender people are often denied health insurance because being transgender is sometimes considered a pre-existing condition. But beginning in 2014, insurance companies will no longer be able to discriminate against anyone who has a pre-existing condition. This means that insurance companies will have to provide the same coverage to transgender people at the same price that they provide that coverage to non-transgender people. Second, no charging women more just because they're women. Third, important non-discrimination provisions that apply to exchanges and health plans sold in exchanges to ensure that all Americans have access to affordable coverage through these exchanges. And that's all Americans regardless of race, color, national origin, disability, age, sex, gender identity, and sexual orientation. There are significant tax credits on a sliding scale for middle class families. There will be better access to Medicaid, so Americans living below 133% of poverty, or about $15,000 for an individual, will qualify, including, for the first time ever, single childless adults. And finally, members of Congress will have to get their coverage in the exact same marketplace that you do. Right now, we can get a glimpse at what we hope to improve as exchanges get up and running. The federal website, www.healthcare.gov, is designed to help all consumers find the health coverage best suited to their needs, and it makes it easy to locate health insurers that cover domestic partners. For example, Healthcare.gov's Health Coverage Finder now includes a same-sex partner filter, allowing same-sex couples to identify health insurance options in their area that cover same-sex domestic partners. Consumers looking for information on domestic partner coverage also have access to Healthcare.gov's regular features, such as the ability to sort based on a planned out-of-pocket cost. The idea is to give you the information you need to make that educated decision to buy a policy in which you're informed and you have the peace of mind of knowing what's covered and what's not. What this means at the end of the day is that for the first time in our country's history, no matter what your situation is, whether you lose your job or your job doesn't offer coverage or you start a business or you retire early, you'll be able to get affordable health insurance. One group of Americans that already has dependable health coverage is our seniors. Nearly 50 million older Americans and Americans with disabilities rely on Medicare each year. And as we get older, most of us will eventually be covered by Medicare if we're not already. So the fourth key way the healthcare law helps is by making Medicare stronger. First, it makes key preventive services available without a copay or deductible to help ensure seniors don't have to skip a potentially life-saving cancer screening simply because they couldn't afford it. Second, it gives beneficiaries in the donut hole a 50% discount on their covered brand name medication. In the past, as many as one in four seniors went without a prescription every year because they couldn't afford it. 
Now, the seniors with the highest prescription drug costs are getting an average of nearly $600 in relief. And the law is expected to close that donut hole completely by 2020. Third, the law provides a historic boost to efforts to crack down on Medicare fraud. In 2011, those efforts returned a record $4 billion. And the law gives law enforcement even more tools to go after those that steal from Medicare. Fourth, the law contains changes that will make it easier for, for doctors to deliver the care that works best for beneficiaries. We know that a person with Medicare who has multiple chronic conditions can see as many as 14 doctors in a single year. That's daunting for anyone to handle. But we also know that the best health systems across this country, they take better care of their patients by having doctors spend more time with them, by focusing on prevention, and by working closely together to coordinate care. The law will help more hospitals deliver this type of care to their patients. And since the law passed, Medicare costs have actually been going down. This year, 2012, average premiums for Part D and Medicare Advantage plans will be lower than they were in 2011. And Part B premiums will go up far less than what was predicted. What this means for seniors overall is a stronger Medicare program that better meets their needs. And what it means is that it's a stronger Medicare program for the beneficiaries of tomorrow. This is a law that will benefit all Americans, whether you're young or old, whether you have insurance through your job, insurance through a government program like Medicare, or no insurance at all. What it means simply is that the health insurance market that works so well for big insurance companies over the years, it's now going to start working better for you. So as you think and you talk about this law with your friends and family, just a couple of few, uh, just a couple of uh, key points to keep in mind. First, the law is not a radical overhaul. It makes improvements to the private health insurance system we already have. Second, the law gives states significant flexibility. They are in charge of most of the implementation. And the law specifically says that if states can find their own way to accomplish the same goals, they're definitely free to pursue it. Third, the law does not add a dime to our federal deficit. According to Congress's official independent scorekeeper, the Congressional Budget Office, the law is completely paid for through a wide range of cost saving reforms, from cracking down on health care fraud to helping hospitals and doctors spend their time more or their health care dollars more wisely. The law provides us the opportunity to finally make health care accessible for everyone and the opportunity to constantly evaluate our health care system and figure out how we can make it better. You know that we take our responsibility to take care of America's health, including that of the LGBT community, very seriously. To make this clear, Secretary Sebelius has set up an internal working group that meets regularly to ensure that we are effectively coordinating policies to best address LGBT health needs across every agency in the department. The work that a number of our agencies are doing includes improving LGBT cultural competency among healthcare providers, encouraging LGBT organizations to apply for grant funding, and sharing resources and ideas across the department because we can all learn from one another. But additionally, in conjunction with Section 4302 of the Affordable Care Act, the Secretary released an LGBT data progression plan last summer, which lays out our plans to collect data on sexual orientation and gender identity in order to gather more information about health disparities in LGBT communities. Some of our agencies are already collecting this information at the program level. We know that in order to best meet the needs of the community we serve, we need to know who it is we're actually serving. This important data will help us get there. So as you think, next slide please. Just kidding. So as you think and talk about the, as you think and talk about the law, let's just remember the four key benefits for you and your family. The healthcare law protects you from the worst insurance company abuses. It drives down costs. It gives you better access to affordable care, and it strengthens our Medicare program. And it does this for all Americans. The health care law is a work in progress, but it's already made some huge improvements that over time will touch every American family in some way. So to learn more about the law and any of the new benefits I discussed, please go to healthcare.gov or in Spanish, go to cuidadosalud.gov. 
You'll find information and plenty of resources you can share with your friends and family. Finally, I'd like to say that Secretary Sebelius and the department as a whole are committed to improving LGBT health across the board. We're including LGBT communities in an unprecedented number of our programs, including, for the first time, Healthy People 2020, a set of national science-based objectives for promoting health and preventing disease for the following decade. We know there's a lot of work left to be done, but we look forward to working together to better address LGBT health needs every single day. Thank you for your time. We look forward to our question and answer session. Great. Thank you so much for that very comprehensive uh, presentation, Myra. Next, we will hear from Kellen Baker. Kellen is Health Policy Analyst at the Center for American Progress. Kellen works in the LGBT Research and Communications Department at the Center for American Progress and is one of the LGBT community's leading experts on LGBT health policy. Kellen will speak about various efforts the community is uh, undertaking on the federal side to ensure that that the implementation of various portions of the Affordable Care Act actually includes uh, LGBT people. Thank you and welcome, Kellen. Thank you, Darlene, and thank you, Myra, and everybody for joining us on the webinar today. As Darlene said, I'm going to walk through some of the major areas that the Affordable Care Act has great potential to help the LGBT community or is already doing so from the perspective of uh, national advocacy. In a lot of ways, this touches on many of the same themes that Myra discussed, and so we're going to be going a little bit more in depth about some of the aspects of these different pieces that specifically touch the lives of LGBT people and their families. If I can get my slides to work. There we go. And uh, approved there, uh, that's unfortunately not for the PowerPoint itself, but actually for uh, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, which was signed into law on March 23rd of 2010. So as everyone has noted, celebrating the second anniversary tomorrow. As Myra talked quite a bit about, we have a problem in this country when it comes to how our health system serves the people that it is supposed to. So. This is a problem clearly for everybody in the country, but it's a particular problem for LGBT Americans. As Secretary Sebelius said at the February 2012 White House Conference on LGBT Health, when this administration took office, the healthcare system wasn't working for a lot of Americans, but it was especially broken for LGBT Americans. That wasn't right. All Americans, regardless of where they live or their age, sex, race, sexual orientation, or gender identity, have a basic right to get the care they need. And that's what the Affordable Care Act is about, making sure that each and every one of us, LGBT people, families, couples, children, and all of our friends and neighbors are able to get the care that they need when they need it. According to Secretary Sebelius in a speech before the National Coalition for LGBT Health in fall of 2011, the Affordable Care Act may represent the strongest foundation we have ever created to begin closing LGBT health disparities. All of those gaps in health status, access to care, well-being that Darlene talked through at the beginning of the webinar. There are 10 things that the Affordable Care Act does that specifically touch the lives of LGBT people. I'm going to go through these one by one, trying to do so quickly, and I look forward to questions toward the end of the webinar. First is data collection. As Myra mentioned, the Affordable Care Act in Section 4302 allows the Department of Health and Human Services to collect any relevant demographic data on health disparities through federally conducted or supported surveys and programs. It has five required categories, and as Myra noted, the Secretary has announced a LGBT data progression plan that lays the groundwork for beginning to collect sexual orientation and gender identity data through national data collection efforts. A question on sexual orientation is being tested right now for the 2013 National Health Interview Survey and gender identity questions are also being developed. The Patient's Bill of Rights. The Patient's Bill of Rights keeps young adults covered up to age 26. That's one of the strongest features of the Affordable Care Act that we've seen so far. For young people who are, whose parents are insured, they are able to stay on that insurance and not become many, like myself, and I'm sure many on the call, 
who were uninsured when they came out of college and didn't immediately find a job that was able to offer them benefits. It ends lifetime limits on coverage, particularly important for transgender people, and phases out annual limits on coverage by 2014. As Myra noted, one of the most significant aspects of the Patients' Bill of Rights for LGBT people is the end of the pre-existing condition exclusions for adults in 2014. In the past, we've seen these exclusions specifically targeting transgender people as well as people with HIV and AIDS and other conditions. And as of 2014, insurance companies will no longer be able to do that. It ends arbitrary withdrawal of insurance coverage and requires, as Myra noted, insurers to put at least 80 or 85 percent, depending on what kind of plan they are, of each premium dollar they collect towards providing medical care for the people that they're insuring rather than paying their administrative costs. Number three, the public coverage expansion sets the national Medicaid eligibility threshold at 138% of the federal poverty level starting in 2014. That means that everyone, regardless of where they live, who is in this income bracket will be able to get coverage through Medicaid. This includes people with HIV and AIDS who previously were often not covered by state Medicaid programs. It also establishes a Medicaid maintenance of effort requirement, which says that states cannot kick people off their Medicaid roles between now and the expansion of the program in 2014. This will make it possible for the significant number of LGBT people that we know who live in this income bracket, who do not have insurance, who cannot get insurance through their jobs, who are living at or very close to the federal poverty level, to access coverage through the Medicaid program in their state, regardless of where they live. Number four is one of the major, major centerpieces of the law requiring every state to have a health insurance exchange starting in 2014. As Myra said, the exchanges will offer subsidized access to private insurance for small employers and people with incomes between 138 and 400 percent of the, of the federal poverty level. Again, a population that includes a significant number of LGBT people and their families. According to a final rule that was released by HHS last week, the exchanges may not discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity in any of their activities. That includes contracting with insurance companies to offer plans to the exchanges. It includes marketing, outreach, and enrollment by any exchange actor, and it includes exchange employees. All exchange plans must offer the 10 essential health benefit categories, which cover areas of care such as prescription drugs, surgery, mental and behavioral health services, and other services that all people, including LGBT people, need to stay healthy. Number five, preventive care. Private insurers must cover certain preventive services without cost. When it comes to some of the disparities that we know affect the LGBT community, these include HIV and other STI testing for people in high-risk groups, depression screening, vaccinations, tobacco use screening, and cholesterol and high blood pressure screening. If folks on the webinar have been following some of the recent news coverage around contraceptive coverage, the Women's Health Amendment requires comprehensive preventive services for women, and HHS has indicated that it will interpret this requirement to include contraception. It also includes intimate partner violence screening and well women visits, as well as Medicare beneficiaries receiving free annual checkups. Number six, healthcare.gov. As Myra noted, there's also a Spanish language mirror website that allows consumers to compare insurance options and, as she said, including a filter for plans offering domestic partner benefits. The healthcare.gov website is one of the most major advances of the Affordable Care Act when it comes to the perspective of consumers since it lays out in language that is easy to understand and easy to navigate what all of the changes that are being made look like and how we all can be engaged in our communities and in our own personal lives in making sure that the law has maximum benefits for ourselves, our families, and our community. Number seven is the healthcare workforce. The law establishes an $11 billion fund to support new community health centers and the expansion of existing centers. It also supports access to essential community providers, such as community health centers, particularly those that have experience in serving underserved populations such as the LGBT community. 
It requires revision of the medically underserved population designation, which underlies the federally qualified health center program. And as Myra noted, it triples the National Health Service Corps to 10,000 people. And the National Health Service Corps has already been reaching out to LGBT advocates to request cultural competency training for those providers who are going into the program. And HRSA has reiterated the Health Resources and Services Administration, which oversees the National Health Service Corps, has reiterated its commitment to non-discrimination for all applicants to the National Health Service Corps, including LGBT people. Number eight, HIV AIDS care. The law eliminates the Medicaid disability requirement for people with HIV. So you, didn't, you no longer have to be classified as disabled uh, as a result of HIV before you can gain coverage under your state's Medicaid program. It eliminates the Medicare Part D donut hole, so allows people who are on medications for HIV to receive rebates and to save money on long-term prescription drug costs. Prohibits pre-existing condition exclusions and higher premiums based on health status, such as HIV AIDS, starting in 2014. And it also promotes patient-centered medical homes as a way to improve quality of care for people who have chronic conditions such as HIV. Non-discrimination protections. The Affordable Care Act, Section 1557, extends federal non-discrimination protections to the healthcare system for the first time. It includes the ADA and the Rehabilitation Act, which protects people on the basis of HIV and AIDS status. It also includes Title IX, which protects on the basis of sex. According to HHS's own equal employment policy, sex explicitly includes gender identity. And that's something that we've been seeing happening on a national level as well in a number of court cases. So there is a great deal of anticipation that it may well be possible for the Office of Civil Rights at the Department of Health and Human Services to investigate complaints against people on the basis of, of discrimination against people on the basis of gender identity or sex stereotyping under these protections on the basis of sex. Number 10, community-based prevention. The law creates the National Prevention Strategy, which is inclusive of LGBT concerns, as well as a $15 billion prevention and public health fund. The fund supports new community transformation grants program at CDC, which has awarded over $100 million to almost 60 communities and states to fight leading causes of illness and death for more than 115 million Americans. These causes of illness and death include many of the disparities that particularly affect the LGBT community, such as cancer, heart disease, and smoking. Community transformation grantees may include the LGBT community as a priority population, and several have done so. We all look forward to seeing when the uh, programs roll out later this spring, how all of the community transformation, grantee, community transformation grant grantees intend to include LGBT communities in their programs. As Secretary Sebelius said, we've come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. Here are some websites that provide more information about what the Affordable Care Act does. The first several are, are generally regarding the Affordable Care Act, the minorityhealth.hhs.gov slash LGBT provides more information about the Department of Health and Human Services LGBT Data Progression Plan. And the last link is to a Center for American Progress report released in spring of 2011 discussing how the law affects LGBT people. And with that, we're going to move from the national to the state level. Thanks for your attention. I look forward to questions. Thank you, Kellen. That was a great uh, presentation. Uh, I know that there are a number of questions that have come forward. Uh, continue to bring them forward, and uh, we will go to our final, final speaker, who is uh, Brad Clark. And Brad is the executive director of One Colorado, and will give us a statewide uh, perspective from uh, the LGBT advocacy community on the implementation of the Affordable Care Act at the state level. So, Brad, why don't you go ahead and we'll take questions after you, after you complete your comments. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, my name is Brad Clark, and I'm the executive director of One Colorado, uh, which is a statewide advocacy group for LGBT Coloradans. Um, I was asked to talk about our work on a state level with regards to LGBT health. 
uh, you know, our work has really been driven by the demand from within our own community in Colorado. You know, as we've traveled the state over the past couple of years, uh, we, we've talked to thousands of LGBT people, and given the conversations and our, our own surveys, we knew the horrible circumstances many in our community face uh, with regards to their health. Um, as we traveled the state and in our own surveys and at town hall meetings, health has consistently been an issue people have identified as one of their top priorities. Uh, and this is specifically true for, for the most underserved within our community, um, specifically transgender folks and those with the least means and without access. Specifically, we've heard the heartbreaking experiences of transgender Coloradans um, being denied care, administering their own hormones, and lacking basic housing and care. And the, the reality was that we found that lesbian, gay, and bisexual folks are much like their straight friends and neighbors. Um, we're struggling with making ends meet, affording health care, and accessing the system. Um, obviously, there are, there are key things under the implementation of the Affordable Care Act that we would like to see to improve the health of our community. You know, things like access for trans-related care, domestic partner recognition, better data collection, and non-discrimination policies to make it unlawful to deny LGBT people access. And we're really excited about what's going on on a, on a federal level to ensure that um, that's being implemented within, within our own state. So mainly how we approached this, we developed a comprehensive report uh, earlier this year on the health and well-being of LGBT uh, people in our state. And we made recommendations to the healthcare system within the state. Uh, some of the things that we found within our own survey was that 20% you know, of LGBT people had been refused service uh, from a health care provider. Uh, those numbers were even more devastating when looking at, at transgender people within the state. 54% of trans folks had said they had been refused service from a health care provider. Uh, another thing we found was that only 60% of our community is out to their provider. And what we found was that the two leading indicators of the quality of care people are getting and how often they go to the doctor and with what sort of results the two leading indicators was, were, one, whether people were actually out and open about their orientation or their identity to their provider, and the second is whether they identified their provider as LGBT friendly. Um, so we've also worked with the Colorado Department of Public Health on their annual purpose survey. Uh, currently, the Public Health Department has added sexual orientation to their annual survey, but not yet gender identity. Uh, so we've been working with them to analyze and interpret the results of that survey. And some of this is just coming out, but w a couple of the things that we found through that, which is going to make um, it a lot easier for us to advocate with public health uh, policymakers and also with healthcare funders, one of the things that we found was that, that, that was lesbians were five times likely, more likely to have cardiovascular disease and twice as likely to be binge drinkers. Uh, we also found that gay men were twice as likely to be smokers. Um, so a lot of that data is going to be extremely helpful for us to advocate with, with public health uh, uh, policymakers and also with, with funders. So what we've done is developed a policy and organizing strategy to move forward based on our own LGBT health report and also the initial data and research from the public health department. Uh, the first of that, uh, the first piece of that strategy is the implementation of the Affordable Care Act uh, at a state level, you know, advocating for things like domestic partner benefits, uh, non-discrimination policies with regards to refusing uh, um, uh, LGBT people service, and also uh, data collection and the, and the implementation of um, uh, information technology uh, through the, the state exchange. And so we've had several initial meetings with the Colorado Health Benefits Exchange uh, board members as well as staff. Um, I think a number of people are really great allies uh, within that community uh, and, and really it's, it's on us to really advocate for some of these key uh, policy objectives. Uh, we're also pursuing a strategy within the regulation process within the Division of Insurance and the, and the Department of Regulatory Affairs to see whether uh, that the, uh, some sort of regulation and rule process could help um, implement uh, these federal rules on a state level. And we've also joined a coalition with consumer advocates um, that have really uh, helped champion many of our issues and, and um, have probably a better sense of the navigation and the process of the implementation of the Affordable Care Act uh, within the state.
and they've been tremendous allies in, in keeping uh, our community on their radar. The second piece that we're looking at is policy development beyond the ACA. Um, things like uh, ensuring that sexual orientation continues to be on the state purpose uh, annual survey and hopefully getting the state public health department to add gender identity. Uh, we're also working to ensure that sexual orientation and gender identity are part of the Office of Health Disparities, much like race or ethnicity. Um, working on data collection through uh, providers and with payers um, through implementation of electronic medical records. And then also working with a number of healthcare funders uh, to ensure that they also have non-discrimination policies uh, with regards to sexual orientation and gender identity. And the last piece that we're really concentrating on is, you know, our belief is all these policies are great and wonderful and tremendous for our community, but if no one knows about it, um, I don't know that they're, they're, um, they're serving its purpose. So I think it's also really important for LGBT organizations to also uh, educate our own community. Uh, we're in the process of developing a statewide LGBT health coalition made up of LGBT and straight allies uh, organizations that will help uh, educate the community and empower the community and educate the community about uh, these new rules and, and their rights. Uh, also, how do we change social norms within our own community uh, to truly expand our lens around and our framework around the LGBT issues to include uh, health? And then also just broader awareness about the health benefits exchange on a state level within our own community. Um, so we're really excited about what's happening on a federal level and, and how can we bring that, um, many of these strategies to, to a state level. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, when that time comes. Great, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your comments, Brad. Uh, there are a number of questions that uh, our participants are asking, so I'd like to go uh, directly to the questions for our panelists. Um, one question is, how can my organization give input on appropriate treatment of trans people and other LGBT people? Myra, is that, um, that a question that you might be able to answer for us? Absolutely. We're constantly looking for feedback on how we can improve our healthcare delivery system. Obviously, we have various agencies that make up the Department of Health and Human Services. On the provider side, our Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services have clear connections to the provider community given the reimbursement models that we're supportive of. Um, but also through our Health Resources and Services Administration, we have a variety of programs that support um, medical residents, nurses, dentists, physician assistants, and we're uh, consistently looking for ways to improve that curricula. Um, you can definitely email external affairs at hhs.gov as a direct line to our, our health, our different agencies, or you can email me with your ideas, and we can help uh, direct you at the, to the appropriate agency. Great. Thank you for that, uh, for that answer. Next question. Uh, does the Affordable Care Act have any provisions for culturally for cultural competency training for either insurance companies or for medical providers? Yeah, yes, the Affordable Care Act does have um, uh, specific provisions aimed at improving cultural competency of providers, not uh, for diverse communities in general. Um, both our Office of Minority Health as well as our Health Resources and Services Administration are part of those those efforts to ensure that uh, providers are better meeting the needs of our diverse communities, like the LGBT community. Um, Kellen, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about your work um, with our agencies um, from someone on the outside. Sure. Yeah, HRSA and SAMHSA have teamed up to have a larger discussion about cultural competency for providers when it comes to the LGBT community, and they are always eager to hear input from providers or who have worked with the LGBT population or who have from LGBT community members themselves. With regard to the Affordable Care Act, actually uh, the recent rule regarding the exchanges does provide states with the opportunity to require that navigator programs that are intended to connect eligible individuals with coverage through the exchange states may impose requirements on them that include cultural competency training and certainly as part of that include LGBT cultural competency training. This would be part of 
helping ensure that the exchanges in each state fulfill the requirement that they not discriminate in any way in any of their activities on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity. Great. Thank you, Kellen. Uh, Brad, I wonder if you could respond to this, or perhaps uh, Kellen or Myra, but I, I thought it might be appropriate, appropriate for Brad. What happens if my state decides not to set up an exchange? Uh, this is Brad. I would defer to Kellen on that question. Actually, this is Myra. I can talk a little bit about that. Um, one of the great opportunities with the Affordable Care Act is, first and foremost, we really want to emphasize the state-based affordable insurance exchanges. Obviously, the needs of different states vary across the country. What's going to work in California isn't going to work in Colorado, isn't going to work in, in the state of Mississippi or Maine. Um, we appreciate the diversity of our states which is one of the main reasons why we're ensuring that states have flexibility in implementing these exchanges. However, a key provision of the law is giving the secretary the authority to create a federally facilitated exchange, one in which the federal government will run. The primary objective of the Affordable Care Act is to give over 30 million more Americans access to quality affordable health insurance. Yes, we appreciate the opportunity for states to have that um, freedom to create an, a state-based affordable insurance exchange but we do have um, the opportunity to create a federally facilitated exchange. And we'll be actually issuing additional information on the, our thoughts on the federally facilitated exchange very soon. And we would uh, definitely encourage you all to comment on our proposal for what that will look like. And um, as we move forward with implementation of the federally facilitated exchange, by all means, we want to make sure that we're meeting the diverse needs of the LGBT community as well. Okay, next question, and I hope that I'm getting it correctly, but when does the preventative care copay end? Does this mean that all copays on all plans are free? Did you say when does it end, Darlene, or when does it begin? When does the copay end, or when does the free preventative care begin? Sure. Um, so we actually issued our rule in July of 2010, and it applies to new health plans after September 23rd, 2010. Um, so this doesn't apply to grandfathered health plans. For those of you on the line that don't know what grandfathered means, it basically means a health plan that was in existence prior to passage of the law. So prior to March 2010, if you had a health insurance plan, that since that time hasn't had these drastic changes, um, that provision does not apply to you. But right now, millions of Americans, actually we, we recently uh, released some numbers that 54 million Americans across the country in 2011 took advantage of the opportunity to get a preventive service without a copay. So it's happening right now, it's a reality for people right now that they can access services without a copay. We strongly encourage folks to call their health plan um, in order to get the more specific information uh, to their situation. Great, thank you. We'll do two final questions. I see we're right up to the three o'clock hour. Uh, next question, will exchanges allow for individualized case management with my insurance company? Will I still have someone to help file claims? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the opportunity for an exchange is to give you a fair, transparent marketplace where you can purchase your health insurance policy. But the best part of that is that you have some security in knowing that your health policy will co cover a basic health benefits package. Your health policy won't discriminate against pre-existing conditions. Your health plan will have to abide by certain non-discrimination provisions. It's that security of knowing that you have a health insurance plan that's going to be there when you need it the most. As far as case management, um, part of the beauty of an exchange is that it's a new marketplace where health insurance companies are going to compete for your business. So if that's something that you're looking for, if that's a market that insurance companies want to be a part of, they're going to design their plans to best meet those needs. Um, so we, we are actually looking forward to seeing health plans be creative in their thinking in order to best respond to the needs of our diverse communities. Great, thanks. And finally, uh, Brad, are there organizations that people can go to in their state that perhaps would help them to understand whether or not what's going on in your state is actually happening in their state and how they might be, uh, be able to get involved? 
For sure. I, I would um, encourage folks to either reach out to uh, their, their statewide LGBT advocacy organization. Um, most states across the country have a, sta a statewide LGBT advocacy group. Um, if, and then also for the groups and the LGBT activists, I would also encourage people to reach out to uh, the, the consumer health folks have been really uh, uh, great in, in working with and, and already have um, our community on their radar when they are advocating uh, for the implementation of the, the health benefits exchange. Great. Well, unfortunately, that is all the time that we have for today. I want to just take a moment to, uh, again, thank all of our speakers for their time and their expertise today. You all did a fantastic job, so thank you very much to uh, Myra Alvarez from the Department of uh, Health and Human Services and to Kellen Baker from the Center for American Progress and uh, to Brad Clark uh, from One Colorado. We really appreciate your comments today. And one last time for folks who uh, have joined us, uh, I just want to also give a special thanks to the Center for American Progress for co-hosting this webinar uh, with the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, and a shout out to Doctors for America for their great uh, sponsorship and help with uh, setting up the technology to make this uh, webinar possible. This has really been a, a great opportunity to hear more about uh, a bill that has helped us all and will continue to help us all, so we're very, very uh, thankful for that opportunity. I want to let folks know that we will email this presentation out next week and make sure that you have uh, uh, access to the presentation. And again, uh, thank you all for participating. I'm Darlene Nipper, Deputy Executive Director of the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, and that concludes our webinar for today. And again, thank you all for participating.